Welcome to San Joaquin College of Law Today, a show dedicated to issues and events within the law school, which are of general interest as well. SJCL Today is produced by San Joaquin College of Law, a nonprofit law school in Clovis, founded in 1969 to provide quality legal education. Over 88% of its graduates have passed the California Bar Examination. More than a quarter of the practicing lawyers in the Fresno area are San Joaquin College of Law graduates. Today's show features the lecture, Why Shouldn't the President Be a Dictator? How to Destroy the Constitution, Subvert the Rule of Law, and End Our Freedom in One Easy Lesson. That was the title of this year's Constitution Day event, presented by San Joaquin College of Law Constitutional Law Professor Jeffrey G. Purvis. A crowd of more than 60 spectators attended the annual event on September 20th. Welcome to San Joaquin College of Law's Constitution and Citizenship Day celebration for 2018. As David Letterman would say if he ever wanted to interview a complete unknown, I need no introduction. I'm Professor Jeffrey G. Purvis. I teach constitutional law at this here law school. I'd like to take a moment Yes, you can't hear me, you say? Seriously, you can't hear me? Well, turn on the mic, everybody. There's no mic. All right, quiet down. Everybody be very, very quiet. I was going to say, <clears throat> I like to take a moment to honor visiting luminaries, although of course I can't possibly mention everyone on the staff and faculty who are here. But I do want to note, as I always do, that my lovely wife Susan, a graduate of this institution, practicing law in the Fresno area, is here. And of course, Dean Justin B. Atkinson, my leader and former co-host on the now defunct Valley Views on the Law show. Oh, Judge Kavanaugh, thank you very much for coming. I see Justice Scalia got his ticket to you. <laughs> or, or should I say Justice Kavanaugh. And uh, a special guest I'm hoping is here, Mr. Carlos Comandang. Raise your hand if you're here, sir. Seriously, you didn't make it? <laughs> well, he's a graduate of Penn State Law, working at a local law firm, and he was a student of my daughter, Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion, Dara E. Purvis, at that institution. So I was going to take an opportunity to embarrass him, but apparently he got a warning. If anybody spots him when he comes in late, let me know. Why do we celebrate the Constitution of the United States? Because if we didn't, terrible things would happen. First, our students would not be eligible for federally subsidized student loans. They would never be able to take my constitutional law class and might be unable to explain to their families and friends why it is important to support and obey the rule of law and the Constitution of the United States. Those family and friends could become subject to the manipulation of demagogues who told them that our country was being overrun by foreigners who were murderers and rapists and who sought to take all of our high-paying American jobs while living in luxury on welfare they did not deserve. They might fail to support democratic institutions attacked by the demagogues and ultimately find themselves having lost their liberty to an autocrat willing to destroy our constitutional system to advance his own personal agenda and the political goals of his supporters. But happily, that cascade of catastrophes will not come about because here we are, supporting the Constitution, attending constitutional law class, some of us, and preparing to become the greatest defenders of the rule of law 
that America has ever seen. Pursuant to Executive Order 13845, I am required to state the following. Quote, Professor Jeffrey G. Purvis makes frequent use of sarcasm and irony. <laughs> SJCL apologizes in advance to everyone offended by his remarks. Because Professor Jeffrey G. Purvis is a liberal, everything he says is false, <laughs> and any evidence he offers to support his statements should be disregarded. The, any opinions expressed by Professor Jeffrey G. Purvis are his alone, and do not represent the opinions of SJCL, the state of California, or Donald J. Trump, <laughs> whom I am told Orrin Hatch actually once said was the greatest president in the history of our country." Close quotes. As the long-suffering attendees of these Constitution Day presentations know all too well, I purposefully formulate lurid and provocative titles for the event in a futile attempt to generate public interest <laughs> and to swell the number of people who would be induced to visit San Joaquin College of Law and learn what an attractive and fine institution of legal education it is. Today's presentation is entitled, Why Shouldn't the President Be a Dictator? How to Destroy the Constitution, Subvert the Rule of Law, and End Our Freedom in One Easy Lesson. And once again, I am vindicated in my approach by the standing room only crowd in this high-tech auditorium to celebrate the founding document that bestrides the world of superhero origin stories like a colossus. My plan is to briefly explore the nature of the rule of law, examine the extent to which the Constitution furthers or satisfies the rule of law, and then ask to what degree the behavior of Donald J. Trump as a candidate and as president threatens to diminish the rule of law. Possibly to a degree where it ceases to function in the United States. What does the rule of law mean? The classic formulation of this concept contrasts the rule of law with the rule of man the latter being a historically accurate but sexist description of societies in which all power was exercised by one or a few males, such as an emperor, a king, the nobility, or a dictator. Philosophers and political scientists have differing definitions of the rule of law, but for present purposes, certain widely agreed upon features can be identified. Law is a set of rules, which the legal philosopher H.L.A. Hart asserted were either primary rules, those that establish legal obligations, prohibitions, and rights, or secondary rules, those which govern the creation, modification, repeal, and adjudication of the primary rules. One of the most important secondary rules Hart called the rule of recognition. This is the ultimate authoritative statement or test for determining the validity of all other rules of law. In the United States, the rule of recognition is the Constitution of the United States. To satisfy the rule of law, the law must be published, that is, made available to the people, must be applied prospectively, meaning conduct which was lawful when it occurred, cannot be punished by a subsequent change in the laws, must be internally consistent, and must be applicable to everyone in society, regardless of a person's status as a government official, soldier, wealthy person, or celebrity. There are numerous other more disputed characteristics that could only be addressed in a much more extensive examination. There is disagreement about whether the rule of law addresses only the procedures by which rules are developed and applied, or whether there are substantive requirements about the contents of the rules. Some philosophers argue that the rule of law requires protection of individual rights. Others conclude that a system that meets the procedural elements described above 
satisfies the rule of law even if it does not protect all or any human rights other than those subsumed by those procedures. When assessing particular real-world societies for compliance with the rule of law, it is likely that not all the elements of that concept will be completely satisfied. One might make the judgment that a society is governed by the rule of law, even if its rules were not completely internally consistent, for example. Or if wealthy individuals were better able to take advantage of the processes and institutions of government than those without economic power. This approach places a society on a continuum, ranging from no rule of law to complete rule of law, and seeks to measure how effectively the society has adopted and effectuates the principles that describe the rule of law. So that leads us to ask, how does the Constitution effectuate the rule of law? It must be noted that ours is a federal system there is a national government established by the Constitution alongside numerous state governments, some of which predated the Constitution, and all of which have their own state constitutions. Those state constitutions serve in an important way as the rules of recognition for state laws. But because the Constitution declares that it is the supreme law of the land, the federal courts have held that state constitutions and state laws must conform to the requirements of the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution establishes a legislative, an executive, and a judicial branch of government, and sets forth procedures by which legislators, a president, and Supreme Court judges are selected. The legislature, Congress, is empowered to make, amend, and repeal laws according to stated procedures. Thus, the requirement that there be laws consisting of primary and secondary rules with a rule of recognition appears to be satisfied. The Constitution vests executive power in the president, who must swear or affirm that she will faithfully execute the office of president of the United States and will, to the best of her ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution provides for a Supreme Court and for such inferior courts as Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. Nothing in the rule of law requires that government power be divided functionally in this manner. From the perspective of the substantive version of the rule of law, this helps protect the liberty of the people by permitting the separate branches to act as checks against each other if any group of government officials abuse their authority to oppress the people. Similarly, the fact that federal judges who are appointed by the president with the advice and consent of the Senate hold office for life unless convicted after impeachment provides the judicial independence that is critical for judges to be able to protect individual rights even when there are political actors seeking to deprive those individuals of their rights. And so, in theory at least, the Constitution's separation of powers enhances the rule of law in our nation, even though it is not a required element of the rule of law. The Constitution provides in Article I, Section 5, that, quote, each house shall keep a journal of its proceedings and from time to time establish the same, accepting such parts as may in their judgment require secrecy, and the yeas and nays of the members of either house on any question shall, at the desire of one-fifth of those present, be entered on the journal." Close quotes. Article 1, Section 7 says, quote, Every bill which shall have passed the House of Representatives and the Senate shall, before it become a law, be presented to the President of the United States. If he approve, he shall sign it, but if not, he shall return it with his objections to that house in which it originated, who shall enter the objections at large on their journal and proceed to reconsider it." Closed quotes. In practice, the federal government publishes a great deal of information about its workings and about the law, including the Code of Federal Regulations, the Congressional Record, the Federal Register, which is the official daily publication for rules proposed rules and notices of federal agencies and organizations, the United States Code, 
which is the statutory law of the United States published in an organized format, and United States Statutes at Large, which is an official record of acts of Congress and concurrent resolutions passed by the United States Congress. This demonstrates that in the United States, rules of law are published and therefore made available to the people. Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution states that no ex post facto law shall be passed. An ex post facto law is one that punishes as unlawful conduct which, it, when it occurred, was lawful. Thus, the Constitution requires that laws be applied prospectively in this important sense. Appellate court decisions are sometimes given retroactive effect <clears throat> in that cases that were filed prior to a particular appellate ruling may be subjected to that ruling if they are still pending after the ruling. But this would not likely be regarded as a retrospective application of law that violated principles of the rule of law. It is not clear whether a retrospective application of a civil law regulation would be unconstitutional. The rule of law requirement that laws be applied prospectively is therefore largely satisfied by the Constitution. The requirement that laws must be internally consistent is generally taken to mean that a person is able to comply with the law and will not be confronted with a situation where to obey one law will simultaneously violate another law. The extent and complexity of federal and state law in the United States makes it impossible for me to claim with certainty that no such inconsistency exists in our statutes, regulations, ordinances, etc. But the sub substantive value of fair procedure represented by the due process clauses of the 5th and 14th Amendments make it very likely that if such a circumstance existed, a strong argument could be made that subjecting the affected person to legal sanction would be unconstitutional. It therefore appears that the rule of law requirement that laws be internally consistent is probably satisfied in our society. As I have alluded, the rule of law requirement that laws must be applicable to everyone in the society, regardless of a person's status, may be one where our constitutional system falls farthest from fully complying with the rule of law. The Constitution, as originally adopted, severely violated this principle. It was explicitly permitted for Africans and later African Americans to be owned as slaves and to be deprived of nearly all procedures and protections of the law. The laws gave women diminished rights, and women were not permitted to vote under the Constitution as originally adopted. Article 1, Section 2 provided that, quote, the electors in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislature, closed quotes. Until 1828, many states only allowed males who owned property to vote. Originally, U.S. senators were chosen by the legislatures of each state, so any inequality in voting for state legislators would be reflected in the selection of U.S. senators as well. Even after slavery was ended by the post-Civil War 13th Amendment, and after women were permitted to vote by the 19th Amendment in 1920, no rational person would say that American laws were applicable to every person regardless of status. The historical oppression in America of people of color, women, and the LGBTQ community needs no elaboration and continues today, reflected in how the machinery of government operates very differently based on race, gender, and sexual orientation. Even though the 14th Amendment provides that no state shall deny to any person the equal protection of the laws, difference in treatment by government between whites and people of color, between males and females, and between heterosexuals and LGBTQ persons persist in the United States. Furthermore, as a practical matter, it is absurd to suggest that our system of laws is applied to individuals in the same manner, independently of whether they are wealthy or poor. 
I am reminded of the famous statement by Anatole France, quote, in its majestic equality, the law forbids rich and poor alike to sleep under bridges, beg in the streets, and steal loaves of bread, close quotes. In the United States, each of us is permitted to hire the finest team of lawyers to broadcast our views on television and radio and the internet, to publish newspapers, to employ accountants, and to do any number of things to utilize the organs of government for our protection or to our advantage. But as the discerning among you will have realized, not everyone has the money to do those things. I think most philosophers would regard this aspect of the rule of law as satisfied, however, so long as the poor are not formally treated differently by the organs of government simply because they are poor. The United States Supreme Court has repeatedly held that the Constitution does not obligate governments to take affirmative action to assist people in exercising their constitutional rights. Government is enjoined only not to interfere with the exercise of those rights within the parameters of constitutional doctrine. There are exceptions. The Sixth Amendment provides that in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. During the 20th century, federal courts interpreted this to require that an attorney sometimes be provided by the government to an indigent criminal defendant at trial and during an appeal of his conviction. This is a rare instance where the Constitution does not permit persons to be treated exactly the same, that is, left to their own devices, without taking any account of their particular economic or social circumstances. More than one philosopher has argued that democracy or self-government is not a necessary requirement of the rule of law. Since the essence of the rule of law, in my opinion, is to ensure that the self-interest and caprice of powerful humans is not permitted to overwhelm the human rights of the less powerful, the substantive variant of the rule of law that requires self-government and protected rights must be the correct version. Unless one believes that some people should have unconstrained power over others, an equal right to vote is essential to satisfy the law applicable to everyone regardless of status requirement of the rule of law. I have already described how the Constitution limited the right to vote by placing control over it in the hands of state legislators. It may serve as a rough metric for the extent to which the rule of law is present in this context to compare the number of persons who voted in a presidential election to the total number of persons in society at the same time. The percentage of the population who voted in presidential elections did not rise above 5% until 1820. In 1900, the percentage was 20%. In 1930, it reached 30%, and in 2012, it was approximately 40%. All of these factors demonstrate that our constitutional system, while having improved incrementally since its adoption, is still far from satisfying the rule of law requirement that laws be applicable to everyone in the society, regardless of their status. I should have used two hands for that. Do the actions of candidate and President Trump threaten to diminish the rule of law in America? Much of the discussion that follows is based on the book, How Democracies Die, by Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt, published in 2018. I recommend that every American read it. Expanding on the work of previous political scientists, Levitsky and Ziblatt developed what they described as behavioral warning signs of a political leader who represents a threat of authoritarianism, but who has not previously engaged in anti-democratic action. And for the first time in San Joaquin College of Law Constitution Day history, 
I have provided handouts setting forth these behavioral warning signs. I hope I made enough. I only made 75. Please follow along and make your own judgments as to whether our president exhibits any of them. As to rejection of or a weak commitment to democratic rules of politics, candidate Trump questioned the legitimacy of the electoral process and accept, uh, suggested that he might not accept the results of the 2016 elections if he did not win. He insisted that millions of illegal immigrants and dead people on the voting rolls would be utilized to vote for Hillary Clinton. Trump's campaign website said, quote, help me stop crooked Hillary from rigging this election, closed quotes. Trump told Sean Hannity in August of 2016, quote, we'd better be careful. I'm not going to do an impression. That's, that's Colbert. <clears throat> We'd better be careful because that election is going to be rigged. I hope the Republicans are watching closely or it's going to be taken away from us, closed quotes. Trump tweeted in October 2016, quote, of course there is large scale voter fraud happening on and before election day, closed quotes. During the final presidential debate, Trump refused to say that he would accept the results of the election if he were defeated. Trump still asserts that millions of illegal aliens voted, which explains why Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by three million votes. During a closed door meeting with donors in March of 2018, Trump said the following about President Xi Jinping of the People's Republic of China, quote, he's now president for life. President for life. No, he's great. And look, he was able to do that. I think it's great. Maybe we'll have to give that a shot someday. Closed quotes. I conclude that Trump demonstrates a very weak commitment to democratic rules of politics. The second factor is denial of the legitimacy of political opponents. Trump challenged the legitimacy of Barack Obama's candidacy by asserting that Obama was born in Kenya and that he was a Muslim. Trump branded Hillary Clinton as a crook and repeatedly declared that she has to go to jail. At his campaign rallies, Trump applauded supporters who chanted, lock her up. Attendees at rallies held after he became president continued to chant, lock her up, whenever Trump mentions Hillary Clinton. It appears to me that Trump regularly denies the legitimacy of political opponents. Third factor is toleration or encouragement of violence. During his campaign, Trump tolerated and even encouraged violence by his supporters, urging them to physically assault protesters. Trump offered to pay the legal fees of a supporter who sucker punched and threatened to kill a protester at a rally. On February 1st, 2016 in Iowa, Trump said, quote, if you see somebody getting ready to throw a tomato, knock the crap out of them, would ya? Seriously, just knock the hell out of them. I promise I will pay the legal fees. I promise, close quotes. On February 22nd, 2016 in Nevada, Trump said, quote, I love the good old days. You know what they used to do to guys like that when they were in a place like this? They'd be carried out on a stretcher. It's true. I'd like to punch him in the face, I'll tell you. Close quotes. February 26, 2016 in Oklahoma, Trump said, quote, in the old days, they'd rip him out of that seat so fast but today, everybody's politically correct. Our country's going to hell with being politically correct. Close quotes. March 4th, 2016 in Michigan, he said, quote, get out of here, get out, out. This is amazing, so much fun. I love it, I love it. We're having a good time. USA, USA, USA. 
all right, get him out. Try not to hurt him. If you do, I'll defend you in court. Don't worry about it. Close quotes. We had four guys. They jumped on him. They were swinging and swinging. The next day, we got killed in the press that we were too rough. Give me a break, you know, right? We don't want to be too politically correct anymore, right, folks? On March 9, 2016, in North Carolina, Trump said, quote, we had some people, some rough guys like we have right here, and they started punching back. It was a beautiful thing. I mean, they started punching back. In the good old days, this doesn't happen because they used to treat them very, very rough. And when they protested once, you know, they would not do it so easily again. But today, they walk in and they put their hand up and they put the wrong finger in the air at everybody and they get away with murder because we've become weak. Close quotes. August 26, am I getting into this too much? <laughs> August 2016, after telling supporters that a Hillary Clinton appointment to the Supreme Court would abolish the right to bear arms, Trump said, quote, if she gets to pick her judges, nothing you can do, folks. Although the Second Amendment people, maybe there is, I don't know, closed quotes. In a phone conversation in April 2017 with President Rodrigo Duterte of the Philippines, Trump praised Duterte's government-sanctioned attacks on drug suspects, in which there had been thousands of extrajudicial, extrajudicial killings without arrest or trial. Trump said, quote, I just wanted to congratulate you because I am hearing of the unbelievable job on the drug problem. Many countries have the problem. We have a problem. But what a great job you are doing. And I just wanted to call and tell you that, closed quotes. It is manifest that Trump tolerates and encourages violence. And the last factor is readiness to curtail civil liberties of opponents, including media. During his campaign, Trump said he planned to arrange for a special prosecutor to investigate Hillary Clinton after the election and declared that Hillary Clinton should be imprisoned. At a rally in Fort Worth, Texas, Trump attacked Washington Post owner Jeff Bezos, saying, quote, if I become president, oh, do they have problems. They are going to have such problems, close quotes. Describing the media as, quote, among the most dishonest groups of people I've ever met, close quotes, Trump said, quote, I'm going to open up our libel laws so that then when they write purposefully negative and horrible and false articles, we can sue them and win lots of money. So that when the New York Times writes a hit piece, which is a total disgrace, or when the Washington Post writes a hit piece, we can sue them, close quotes. In February 2017, Trump tweeted, quote, the fake news media, parentheses, failing at New York Times, at CNN, and at NBC News, and many more, close parentheses, is not my enemy, it is the enemy of the American people. Sick, close quotes. And in August 5th, 2018, Trump tweeted, quote, the fake news hates me saying that they are the enemy of the people only because they know it's true. I am providing a great service by explaining this to the American people. They purposely cause great division and distrust. They can also cause war. They are very dangerous and sick." Closed quotes. Thus, Trump has certainly exhibited a readiness to cur curtail civil liberties of opponents, including the media. Here is how the authors of How Democracies Die summed up their application of the four factors of authoritarianism to Donald Trump. Quote, with the exception of Richard Nixon, no major party candidate met even one of these four criteria over the last century. Donald Trump met them all. No other major presidential candidate in US history including Nixon, 
has demonstrated such a weak public commitment to constitutional rights and democratic norms. Trump was precisely the kind of figure that had haunted Hamilton and other founders when they created the American presidency, closed quotes. I can imagine that to some, perhaps many, my discussion of Trump's authoritarian tendencies may be overwrought. After all, this is America, the kind of democratic elected leaders who later manifested authoritarianism, like Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, followed by Maduro, like Viktor Orban in Hungary, or Erdo Erdogan in Turkey, they all operated in foreign nations without the long democratic traditions of the United States. Our nation may have genocidally dispossessed the Native Americans, owned the Africans as slaves, locked Japanese Americans into concentration camps, and banned Muslims. But we have never turned the power of government against our white selves, except for minor incidents like McCarthyism and the murder of students at Kent State. As has been confidently proclaimed my entire life, it can't happen here. I must also acknowledge that my approach to topics like this is affected by my natural paranoia and deep suspicion I have of anyone who holds great power. We can take comfort in the likelihood that Trump will never have to declare himself dictator. The Republican Party is presently in control of all three branches of government so that the Founders' supposed ward of checks and balances has already frayed badly. The Supreme Court is about to welcome a new justice who believes that the President should not be subject to any investigation while in office, except impeachment, one presumes. The administration and its allies openly and vigorously urge the President to fire the Attorney General for the unforgivable offense of recusing himself from overseeing any investigations into cases related to the 2016 campaign. The president has already pardoned convicted criminals who share his political views, has floated the idea of pardoning those of his associates who have already been convicted or pleaded guilty to crimes potentially involving himself, and has toyed with the notion of exercising the presidential pardon power on himself if things continue to go badly for his legal position. Partisan gerrymandering and voter suppression via draconian voter ID laws, purging of voter rolls, the shuttering of polling places, all approved or tolerated by the Supreme Court, may already have locked the Republican Party into power. Thus, there would be no need for Trump to exercise his authoritarian tendencies by openly defying or flouting constitutional limits on government power. I have spoken in previous Constitution Day presentations as my computer blows up. It's the government, it's the government is right. And I was just getting to the good part, too. <laughs> I have spoken in previous Constitution Day presentations of the notion advanced by legal philosopher John Rawls that for a self-governing society to retain its democratic character, there must be an overlapping consensus of worldviews among a sufficient number of people who may disagree about important aspects of politics, religion, and culture, but who accept that despite these differences, there are core political values that must be supported. The rule of law, especially in its substantive variants, is one of those values. H.L.A. Hart, who I mentioned above, had a more elitist version of this principle. He argued that at any given moment in a society which lives by rules, there is likely to be a tension 
between those who accept and voluntarily cooperate in maintaining the rules, which Hart called the internal view of law, and those who reject the rules and attend to them only from an extern external point of view as a risk of possible punishment. I analogize the external point of view to someone who obeys the law only so long as another is watching, or a card player willing to cheat so long as he does not get caught. Hart asserted that the rules of behavior which are valid according to the system's ultimate criteria of validity must be generally obeyed by everyone, which I believe represents at minimum an external type acceptance of them but that the rules of recognition specifying the criteria of legal validity and its other secondary rules must be effectively accepted as common public standards of official behavior by a sufficient number of government officials. This means that a core of government officials accept that the rules of law are both legally valid and morally appropriate and acknowledge a legal and moral obligation to obey those rules. I was recently dismayed to learn that a San Joaquin College of Law alum in answering an alumni survey said that I slandered Republicans. This made me very sad. <laughs> to think that a graduate of this fine institution failed to learn that it is not possible to commit slander as to a large number of people. <laughs> I also wanted to remind this graduate who was not identified that in order for there to be a defamation, the statement made must be proven false. <laughs> As I actually do in class discussions, I will ask the following questions about all officials of whatever political party. Do you believe that politicians and public officials generally engage in political behavior according to internalized, widely accepted norms of fairness equal treatment and transparency? Or do they take whatever political action they believe will both win political office and not result in legal punishment? <clears throat> Similarly, do judges, regardless of the political party that supports them, make judicial decisions by applying in good faith neutral principles of law? Or do they impose their own personal or moral preferences on the outcome then use their rhetorical skills or those of their elite law clerks to justify a decision already made. My point is this. It seems as though a commitment to the rule of law and to democratic values and institutions is fraying in the United States. The consensus of overlapping worldviews, the core of government officials who take the internal view of law as something to be obeyed because it is just, is shrinking, if not gone. In such a circumstance, the emergence of a powerful political official such as the president, who in addition to the amorality, mendacity, narcissism, ignorance, and other odious personal characteristics he has exhibited, shows not just a disregard, but even a contempt for the legal and political norms we once cherished, threatens catastrophe to our democracy. If it were established that Trump had violated the laws of the United States and the House of Representatives were to file articles of impeachment, the latter a complete fantasy, what would stop Trump from declaring the impeachment a rigged witch hunt? And even if, a further fantasy, the Senate were to convict, what would stop Trump from simply refusing to leave office? Who would enforce and protect the Constitution of the United States then? Perhaps it would be our military personnel who are trained, when given a direct order by a superior, to investigate its constitutionality before compliance. <laughs> Some people think President Trump is wonderful because he is accomplishing important policies that they strongly support, greatly restricting legal immigration, expelling undocumented immigrants from America, protecting males accused of sexual offenses against women, reducing or eliminating any government efforts to address climate change or pollution, dismantling, dismantling public education, reconfiguring the tax laws and the regulatory environment generally 
to benefit wealthy persons and corporations and so on. Whether a significant number of these people agree with this support of white nationalists or are concerned with any negative personal characteristics Trump may have, they are willing to continue to support him because they like what he's doing. <clears throat> a significant number of people who do not agree with Trump's policies either can't be bothered to vote, except for illegal aliens, or will be prevented from voting by regulatory measures created by Republican legislators and approved by Republican judges. So there be, may be no occasion when Trump's authoritarian tendencies might need to become official action. But those tendencies should be a matter of concern for every American. I urge you all to remain alert and to vote whenever you are presented with an opportunity. Thank you. I generally like to give the audience an opportunity to ask questions or if they dare make comments. <laughs> Usually Professor Kucera's got something in the queue. I don't mean to, you know, focus on anybody. I do actually. <laughs> and, and I say that because uh, last Constitution Day, Professor Kuchera asked a very interesting question, and my answer to it outraged many of the students. So I was hoping we could duplicate that. <laughs> so I actually was thinking about this question before I heard you talk, because I assumed what you were going to say. Hmm. Well, it's a problem with all three things. I, I detailed the, the serious, serious flaws in the original document, some of which have been partially ameliorated. But the structure that the founders chose, in my understanding, assumed that there would be numerous competing political groups of rich white guys all seeking to take advantage of government position to advance their own selfish aims. And that the liberty of all would be protected by this competition and the fact that in that context, it would be very unlikely that more than one branch of government would represent any particular group. I believe it is widely agreed by scholars and historians that the founders did not anticipate the two-party system that our politics immediately took shortly after the Constitution was adopted. So the, the structural protection of checks and balances, I think is its flaws are becoming apparent to us right now because it is possible for a single political group to have control of all three branches. Now, the interpretation issue is largely something that is measured by how the Supreme Court performs its uh, function. And uh, my current and former constitutional law students will fondly recall although I'll ask you to turn off all the microphones before I say this, <laughs> that I refer to the Supreme Court justices as evil, insane clowns. Because they're not stupid, so they're either evil or they're doing it uh, in, out of insanity. And sometimes when you read what they write, you just say, who are these clowns? But I, seriously, I and Judge Posner and a few other people you know, and they're actual serious scholars, unlike myself, recognize that Supreme Court justices, among other judges, and if there are any judges in the audience, I'll ask you to leave now, <clears throat> make their decisions first and then use their legal rhetorical skills to engineer 
an explanation. A judicial opinion is a persuasive document designed to convince everyone that they're right and humiliate the people who dissent, or vice versa. So in, since that mechanism exists, enforcement of, of constitutional rights and limitation on government power that the Constitution was supposed to provide becomes weaker and weaker. You know, so the, the recent evisceration of the Voting Rights Act, the approval of draconian voter ID laws in the face of overwhelming evidence that voter fraud is very, very minor. There, there are instances of voting fraud, perhaps two or three every election. So when nobody's enforcing the Constitution, all of the things that it's set up to maintain the rule of law won't function. It, it can't run on automatic. It requires an informed and vigilant citizenry to vote into office government officials who will, do revere and will obey democratic norms. And it doesn't make me feel any better to say that we get the government officials we deserve, because I don't deserve them. <laughs> but, you know, our typical percentage of eligible voters voting ordinarily is below 50%. So, all of the above. I specialize, for those of you not familiar with me, in long answers to short questions. Thank you. Yes, sir. Why is there so little concern for democracy today? Well, I mean, that's the $64 billion question. Um, I, I, I don't like to criticize teachers in any form, but I'm usually very willing, unless Dean Pearson is present, to criticize administrators of educational institutions, not, of course, Dean Justin V. Atkinson. And it may be that our educational system, under tremendous pressure to provide job-ready workers, has continually de-emphasized the kind of civics training that really old people like myself, I don't see anyone in the room nearly as old as I am, used to have in middle school and in high school and in college. We could actually major in political science and grow up and get a job. So that must have a fact, factor in it. And then, the young folks grow up watching what people like politicians do. And uh, student politicians don't count. Who doesn't revile politicians of all kinds, of every party? How many times have you said, I really admire this politician? I don't say that very often. I say, my God, I hope this politician wins because she's a lot better than that one. And so I'm going to vote for this one. So apparently the breakdown of the maybe consensus that once existed among a sufficient core of government officials and interested citizens that democratic values are important and benefit us all has simply withered away. The more important question is, how can we get it back? And I have an easy answer to that. Funnel a lot more resources into schools, into teachers, and then that'll eventually take care of it if we're not destroyed by then. Not to mention climate change and cyber attacks and, you know, everything else that's going on. All right, well, Moot Court needs the classroom. Oh, sorry, did I miss a question? Where? Yes, sir. Well, first you were, you were talking about the, the low number of uh, um, people voting when they shouldn't. Uh, in the 2016 election, there was only one case a woman tried to vote for Trump a second time. And that was the only, uh, the only uh, arrest for, uh, for doing that during the 2016 presidential election. But 
my question is, between the electoral I'm not sure. So you're vindicating my point that yeah. voter fraud is not really real. Person tried to vote for Trump the time. Well, who wouldn't? Yeah. <laughs> um, but between the Electoral College and the lack of uh, runoff elections when no one received the plurality of votes, it really seems like the, the system was designed for two parties. What, what sort of changes would you recommend in order to encourage there to be multiple parties so there's a, a bit more competition in, uh, for, for power within the federal government? Well, I think it's a serious problem as to the, the checks and balances concept of the two-party system. But I'm not sure whether other greater problems wouldn't be represented by a multiple party system. Um, I would characterize, at least in my understanding, the political system of, say, the UK and other uh, European nations as uh, multi-party. And yet, they have the same kinds of problems uh, limiting government power that we do. And again, uh, not to you know, press any buttons, but it's my understanding that in Israel, for example, uh, conservatives and liberals are roughly balanced. So the most conservative religious party, which agrees to side with one side or the other based on whether they're agenda is furthered, has tremendous power, and it's a very small uh, party, relatively speaking. So rather than trying to amend the Constitution to deal with the we only have two party system, I think it's safer and more fruitful to commit ourselves to enforcing the Constitution as it is now, to electing politicians who do place the interests of society ahead of their own interests, and for them to select judges or elect judges, because our state judges are elected, who instead of promising to convict everybody who walks, will promise to make, uh, make decisions analytically according to neutral principles as, they, as best they can. I think that's a superior solution. And with that, I'll thank you again for coming and speak to our members. And that brings us to the end of this edition of San Joaquin College of Law Today, presented by San Joaquin College of Law, a nonprofit law school committed to educational excellence and community service. The views expressed do not necessarily reflect the position or views of San Joaquin College of Law. This program has been produced in conjunction with the Community Media Access Collaborative. We invite you to join us in the future as we explore issues and events within the law school which are of general interest as well. For more information about San Joaquin College of Law, please visit our website at www.sjcl.edu or call 559-323-2100.